Master Reddit. Subscribe for more videos. You know that novel you've never written, what is it about? It's about a witch who cursed the world so that a sinful person turns into a monster every 100 years based on his sin. The story is more so of an anthology focusing on different cursed people. For example a werewolf who retains his sanity but cannot change back unless he devours another human, essentially doing an inhumane act to appear human. A medium, someone who speaks with the dead, who got fed up with the ghosts asking for help so she starts consuming their souls to shut them up turning into a soul eater. I've been calling it the cursed since. I really like the idea and I think this could turn into a modern fairy tale full of irony QND sarcasm. Has a lot of potential for some dark humor too. I would also suggest a psychic, who despite being highly sought after, has given up on telling people their future, because they never listen anyway, and think it was her who cursed them. Alright, this a good idea with a good format. Would read. Humans are routinely kidnapped as children by an ancient and powerful spacefaring race and used as slave soldiers due to our comparative size, strength, and how difficult it is to kill us, and humans become the most feared warriors in the galaxy. After a tour of duty they're told that they are free, but the location of Earth is kept secret due to its value as a source of warriors, so they have no choice but to enlist again, or work as mercenaries, pirates, or private security until they die. A wreck of an old explorer ship belonging to this ancient race is being salvaged by a human crew, and they find a geological survey of our solar system, including the location of Earth. The discovery of this survey gets out and sparks a race between warring factions to destroy Earth, and a ragtag bunch of humans trying to get home and save their home. Edit. Holy shit I honestly expected this to just get buried by heaps of other awesome ideas, I definitely did not foresee this reaction. Loads of you guys have recommended other books with similar stories, and several recommendations for me to check out r slash fee, which I absolutely will. Thank you for all your kind words. You've absolutely inspired me to try and give this a shot. Hope I can live up to your expectations smile. Alan Dean Foster, The Damn Trilogy. God ducking damn it, hits a little on a note of actual possibility. Aliens never land because honestly, what world has three world wars with itself? What kind of species develops thermonuclear low elevation detonating missiles before they invent magnetic resonation imaging? The kind that you absolutely don't let into space as an entire species. They killed off all of the lions in England for goodness sakes. These are all reasons for humans being selected. In the context of this galactic community, we're a uniquely warlike species. I envision them starting by observing Spartans, Vikings, and Mongols and the like. Earth is like Space Florida and Space Australia combined for the rest of the galaxy. Also for the purposes of this story, the aliens in question have adapted to life in zero-g and so need other species to fight ground wars for them. How plants once dominated the planet, then they got bored, got rid of their minds and decided to live peacefully without organs or anything, just living. Kinda wish I could do that. I'm planning to write this, the when is yet undetermined and possibly it would never be. But. I've outlined the whole thing, it would be in four parts, the rise, the flourish, the doom, the humans. I actually started writing it, but haven't touched it in a while. I hope to go back to it eventually. You know how so many fantasy plots revolve around a group of heroes that have to go banish the ultimate evil every 100 years or whatever and this time they do it for real? Well that's happened already and the world is a utopia. So a dumb group of teenagers decide that life is too boring and go on a quest to release the baddie and make life interesting again. Clearly it's the start to a trilogy, where they release him by book 2, after finding a ragtag group of friends in book 1 to help of course, and then book 3 time to undo it because oops they banished him for a reason. Kinda wish I could do that. I'm planning to write this, the when is yet undetermined and possibly it would never be. But. I've outlined the whole thing, it would be in 4 parts. The Rise, The Flourish, The Doom, The Humans. The short version, an ancient set of civilization wiped one another out with all manner of various super weapons, effectively shattering the magic, technology, physics, natural laws that existed at the time, the war essentially broke physics as it originally occurred. The longer, more detailed description. It's a few thousand years later, but the nature of some of these weapons is now being rediscovered. They weaponize the creation of pocket dimensions, each civilization involved in the war utilized small breaches in reality that they created to store world-ending weapons, they broke down the local system's asteroid belt, some of the moons, and even a few of the outer planets just for the mass for immense capital ships that could be hidden in dimensions that now open into, say, someone's closet, basement, 
a random cave, etc. A few of the breach locations are being rediscovered, and current science is just starting to rediscover how to open these doors. The capital ships aren't all there is, those are few and far between. Mostly, supply caches, small mechs, armored vehicles, small arms, magical supplies are hidden everywhere on old battlefields, in the oldest of cities, anywhere these civilizations once existed. The smallest of dimensions are beginning to fall open on their own, and the pockets of pre-apocalypse space being exposed to this dimension is healing the broken attributes of physics that once allowed for the creation, and eventual destruction of things that the older civilizations built. It became popular not only for military use, but for civilians as well, pocket dimensions were torn into homes just for extra storage, for cars, for food hoarding, etc. Some could be keyed to open for specific individuals, some would open if you only knew the correct phrase to speak in its proximity, and so on. Areas where portals have been opened are instantly worth a fortune, as this means that physics will function as it once did in those small, isolated areas. A rune, or spell inscribed, incanted correctly outside this area will do nothing, perhaps glow slightly. When brought inside an area where a portal has recently fallen open, it will function perfectly. Or fail spectacularly. This has resulted in all manner of chaos, petty criminals are finding ancient small arms that can detonate entire buildings, or city blocks. Giant, ancient war machines, automotive mostly, are automatically setting the first person they see as their owner, admin, after having been unattended for millennia. This also includes dogs, cats, which had been genetically, magically enhanced to be fully sapient. Without magical reinforcement, this effect has lessened, but it's beginning to take hold slowly again. This can result in scenarios such as what we would see as normal dogs suddenly having command of multi-ton mechs that can understand them, either wreaking havoc, or letting their masters command the mecha, depending on how well trained they were. Children with spell books that were previously seen as toys, reproductions of ancient lore suddenly find themselves with real magic, People obsessed with studying them suddenly find themselves with the potential to be arch magi, and are approached by ancient systems that recognize them as mages, or potential mages, and are seeking out new admins. Entire new markets have opened up for artifacts, especially the old consumer technology, which has been preserved in pockets of suspended decay. Entropy has been conquered once, even food didn't decay when stored in these. Many civilians had been in their own private dimensional pockets when physics collapsed, pushed to the brink by extreme overuse, by the time portal locks began failing, they had all gone completely insane from the isolation. They hadn't aged, but trapped inside with exits that no longer worked, or simply killed anyone who entered them. There weren't many found that were even sane enough to speak. Only very, very few were left capable of interacting with others, save for the few that had suspended animation tech inside their pocket dimensions. Rewards are offered for anyone wearing old world clothing, or found speaking unknown, unrecognized languages, or babbling incoherently after having appeared in empty rooms. A few ancient scientists have been recovered, and a few teachers, those are always instantly snapped up by the state. Those that find, turn them in, alive, are rewarded with riches sufficient to buy small countries, assuming the individual turns to be sane, which is rarely the case. Some portals, rather than opening to only pocket dimensions, served as airlocks to the old mining facilities that were used to mine other planets in the local solar system, the asteroid belt, outer heliosphere space stations, or just opened into what used to be facilities on other planets, and is now just hard vacuum inside what were once structures. In a few disastrous cases, when both portals fell open at once, the airlock space failed, and opened small townships to hard vacuum until something large enough, and strong enough, to hold the portal closed was placed around it. And so on. I've really only built the world so far, no main characters, but it could go anywhere from disaster movie to Indiana Jones's type scenarios. Or full-on JRPG with Mecha and Magitech, magic. A dystopian future in which sleep is not counted as prison time, because you are not conscious when asleep. Prisoners begin using more and more extreme methods to keep themselves awake, so they serve as little time as possible, and prison violence sees an all-time high as inmates attempt to knock each other unconscious, so as to make their opponent's jail time last longer. The whole universe actually consists of a multiverse, but the whole collection of that multiverse actually still exists within the bubble. This is the story about the land on the edge of that multiverse. It is a land that infinitely stretches in all direction, and has no natural inhabitants. However, there are still people who are accidentally pulled into this universe due to a combination of sheer bad luck and a space-time anomaly, and those people become its inhabitants. They are stuck there permanently since there isn't a known way out. 
Due to this, basically no two inhabitants are from the same universe, except for very specific instances, and all of them are wildly different, from gods and celestial beings, to normal people like us, to totally random species. The stories I make up then revolves around the beings that live within this world. The first ever beings to arrive, the individuals who are able to change it significantly, to even the regular Joes that are simply unlucky enough to get yoted into this place. That's actually a pretty good start for a Sekai type story. Actually part of my inspiration was to create an Isekai type story. However I also wanted the theme to focus more on the fantastical and exploration aspect, and to basically cut out all those spiel about harems, op protagonists, and cheap villains. So basically to create an another world type story that is closer to traditional fantasy than light novel stories. The setting is also noticeably much more serious than a lot of Isekai stories, with a lot of the side stories having themes about revenge, power, regret, all those stuff. Set hundreds of years in the future after a nuclear civil war destroys American society, it's about a farmer who becomes the president of a republic in the mountains of southern Appalachia. Scientists were wrong, karma is real, but it works a bit differently than expected. Reality is made of an infinity of superposed dimensions and each action you take tunes your brain and sends your consciousness in a slightly different reality. Good actions sends you to better realities, bad actions take you to worse realities. You might not be able to notice it, but those tiny incremental changes in reality add up fast and the worse you act, the worse the world gets around you. There is no afterlife, no reincarnation. Elders were wrong about this. But they were right about paradise and hell, and it's right here among the living. We're just not all conscious in the same version of reality. It's based off a writing prompt, and two chapters were done last year. It's called Conquest Club, and it's about an after-school club that somehow has the resources needed for world domination. Throughout the book the confused protagonist starts to understand the motives of the group. Now that we have quarantine going to finish the first draft. Our urban fantasy novel series set in my town and the surrounding area. A natural magic user gets contacted by the local werewolf pack to investigate the murder of a wolf, regular wolf. Upon investigation, he discovers that the wolf had its soul ripped out. Magic user follows lead, finds the person who did it, and discovers a huge plan based out of Pittsburgh to sever the spirit world from the physical world. Who is orchestrating it? A vampire. A science fiction novel where in the near future people who commit terrible crimes aren't killed, but sedated. Once a year they get a day to wake up and see what has changed. It'll be about the horrors of seeing your life flash before your eyes as well as the characters the murderer impacted. Imagine you are 30 and kill someone. You go to trial and find out your sentence is somewhere between 20 and 30 days to live. Except on day 10 you get cancer. How my extended family basically tricked and manipulated my father into paying for my second cousin's wedding, 30 year old male, down to the church flowers and toothpicks at the reception, we are a middle class family in Europe. They then asked him not to tell anyone because it's embarrassing. And next week my cousin and his 6 month pregnant bride buy a used BMW coupe. There is a load of crazy details and the characters involved basically have to be put on page. Dark superhero novel, a sad depressed guy jumps from top of a building only to open his eyes and realize he is floating above the pavement. He has no memory of why he choose to jump. Hero gets his suppressed power. But unlike a generic superhero his power only lasts till he is depressed and suffering from mental health issues. He goes on to help save a lot of lives but each person he saves takes away from his superpower as he keeps feeling better about himself. Towards the end of the novel he has 15 underscore 20% of his flight power left and uses that to fly one last time to enjoy the freedom, while doing so he realizes he is not depressed anymore. At that moment his powers disappear and he crashes to the ground breaking both his legs. Years go by and our hero gradually falls back into depression as he is not able to do the one thing that made happy saving people's lives. He goes to the top of his apartment building and jumps, only to open his eyes and find himself floating above the pavement with no memory of why he chose to jump. A group of engineers recognizes the threat that mankind poses to the universe if we are allowed to expand uncontrollably throughout the universe. To prevent our spread humanity is encapsulated within a planet-sized cage constructed of self-repairing nano-robots, if part of the cage is destroyed the robots will fill the void again. Further, the cage is then subdivided into society-sized cells with walls in between them to prevent the different sects of mankind from attacking one another. There is a forced peace. Each society is allowed to independently develop their own ideological, political, and economic systems without fear of external threat. 
the most successful societies will be allowed to have a mitotic split, while the least successful societies will die off. The hope of the engineers that implemented the prison is that the perfect society will be created after enough generations of evolution have occurred. The protagonist of the story was born into one of the wealthiest, most efficient of the societies of all. Productivity, measured in man-hours, was of the highest priority. Unfortunately the protagonist makes the mistake of interrupting the highest-ranking politician at the General Assembly. The interruption, just two minutes long, is calculated to have directly wasted hundreds of thousands of man-hours of all attending the assembly, and indirectly wasting millions of man-hours of lost productivity. The protagonist is sued by the public and is held liable for damages. He is placed on a debt repayment plan lasting over a hundred years. As a stipulation of the repayment plan, he must heed the advice of a financial advisor, who has planned out a schedule for his life down to the hour that will allow him to make good on his debt. As the story progresses, key themes are questioning what it means to be efficient with our time. What is wasted time? Is there a most efficient way to live? Should we live that way, or even fight to be inefficient instead? If I get even a single reply I'll write it. I'm pretty easy that way. A strange object crashes onto the Arctic, and world governments send commando squads to investigate. They are told to work together, explore the wreckage, terminate everything non-human, take evidence and leave. They are lead by a UN squad. However, a mercenary squad was sent by a mobster, the mercenaries trick the commandos into thinking their fellow comrades want them dead, and they separate. Throughout the book, we follow five different squads surviving, the Brits, SAS, the Russians, Spetsnaz, the Americans, SEAL, the mercenaries, and the UN squad. The mercenaries also jam communication, and leave everybody stranded. However, everybody soon find out that there was a virus that crashed with the object, and that it is highly toxic, the mercs get poisoned and die, UN and SEAL squad reunite, while SAS and Spetsnaz squad reunite too. What ensues is a mass shootout between the two sides, one side, UN plus SEAL, saying that they should recover the virus, and the other side, Spetsnaz plus SAS, saying that they should nuke it. The last man standing is a SAS officer, who calls in a nuke strike, they unjam the comms before the shootout, and the place getting nuked, with the virus being destroyed forever. About a couple of HS sweethearts that broke up because they couldn't make a long distance relationship work but find each other a decade or so later and decide to give it another shot. I just want to write about how a man and woman experience their 20s, college slash uni, entering the job market, dealing with bosses, dealing with parents who are growing annoyingly old, etc., the insecurities that come with not achieving the totally unrealistic dreams they had at 17, comparing themselves to the expectations they had for each other or to how well slash badly their former classmates are doing, things like that. Oh, and since this would probably be a very smutty novel, with a possible femdom twist, I want to explore how people mature sexually as they approach their 30s. I mean, my 17-year-old self was intimidated by something as natural as the thought of my GF masturbating alone. And she, in turn, was desperately insecure about me going down on her. I think it'd be fun to look back at those days through the eyes of two people who know so much better by now. A main character is living in a dystopian world. In a city that's surrounded by an ever encroaching wall of ice. The government is a technocrat and watches everything the people do. People are only allowed to breed with those deemed a good genetic match. To ensure that the next generation are strong enough to survive. As far as anyone knows they are alone in the world. The government has sent limited probes into space and found a suitable spot to start again. So the plan is to send a ship of seed life on this planet. And continue on the species. The protagonist falls in love with a laborer. Not especially bright but kind and good-natured. They hide and secretly meet up as much as possible put eventually the lover is found and executed for a different infraction, this was inadvertently helped by the protagonist. The protagonist is devastated and can barely hold it together. If the government ever found out they would be next on the list. Two years later the mission is a go and our protagonist is chosen to lead the mission. This whole time the hatred of what the government did and the chance to break free of their watch and saving humanity is the only thing keeping the protagonist going. As the crew orbit the Earth they realize the truth, they were never alone on Earth as they had thought. The Earth in fact is thriving and bustling. This along with the everything else pushes the protagonist over the edge. The protagonist knowing that the people that were left are in such a miserable state for a greater purpose decides to do something about it. They have a link to Central Command. They communicate frequently regarding what is going on. 
What Commando knows that the images of Earth have been broadcast every way possible and even to the people of the city they came from. The people seeing the truth decide to riot and rebel against the Technocray. The crew of the shuttle decide it is better to risk it back to Earth than go on what was likely a near suicidal mission. So all board the module meant to them to land on the planet they were to seed and aim for Earth. Our protagonist stays behind intending to crash the shuttle unable to bear the guilt and heartbreak suffered. Any comments or criticism are appreciated. The other day I thought of a really innovative story. So there's a kid that is born a slave, see? Then he gets taken away by a couple monks from another planet and trains to become a really powerful space monk. The kid grows up and falls in love with a famous actress called Padley Nortman who's older than him in the story but not in real life. Then an evil politician starts manipulating him and the space monk becomes an evil sinner and falls into lava while fighting from the low ground and gets asthma. I should register this before someone steals my idea. Sounds interesting, as long as the evil politician is able to shoot lightning bolt from his hands while also shouting unconstrained energy. Also the space monks use a special weapon called luminous scimitars which are scimitars made from solid light. And, for last, they can use the spaceships to jump into ultra space and go instantly to any place in the universe, but only when it's convenient for the plot. When it's not convenient, they just forget that they can do that and nobody mentions. Hey! Looks like someone leaked my novel. It'll help you, I have an idea for a second movie. So the asthma monk is now ruler of the galaxy with the politician guy. Then his son who is played by Hark Ma Mil tries to save his sister with the old monk, a gunslinger and a briard dog. Then old monk dies. Then the son of asthma monk finds out that angry monk is his father, he loses his monk hand and he meets a frog that uses drugs and drives a Honda Civic. Then they need to save the gunslinger from a snail, and the sister of the son of asthma monk kills the snail. They join forces with some gummy bears in the forest. Then they blow up the giant planet thing. The politician and asthma monk die, and they have a party with the gummy bears. I also have an idea for another trilogy, and I also have ideas for some spin-offs. And what about a series? It's a cosmic horror novel written in the format of a series of research papers, where each chapter is a research paper that has been translated from the archives of some ship we found on the moon. In the earliest logs, the lead researcher has recently been demoted to lead the division named Methods for Containment and Control of Lower Dimensional Beings, or that's the closest translation. He is upset about this, as he believes it is beneath him as one of the original creators. Regardless, he takes pride in his work and proceeds with stress testing the lower dimensional forms. Gradually the logs unfold to show that what is actually being studied is various methods of torture. These begin brutishly, like something out of Saw, never in detail, only hinted at, and throughout the logs gradually evolve to be more nuanced and complicated, and more psychological. For instance, one day the researchers observe that when the test subjects are having tests administered, they emit a high-pitched mewling that must serve as some means of communication. Upon further examination, this mewling seems to heighten the effect of the tests on other subjects once they are exposed to it. Very curious, must investigate further. Etc, etc, that kind of thing. This moves on to community experiments, finding out that the subjects appear to be able to hurt each other, how they deal with limited resources, etc. Eventually, the final chapters detail the construction of a larger test chamber, Earth, wherein a longer term test is going to be run. Ultimately the idea is that all of this was just a test to create the version of things that results in closest to the largest amount of suffering possible over the longest time frame attainable. Then the the final chapter is the researcher observing the reader becoming aware of the logs and their contents, and making notes about their perceived responses. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the thumbs up button and comment below letting me know. It helps the channel and lets me create more content just like this. If you do like this type of content, make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss an upload.